Uh, everyone, uh, welcome to the 2021 Virtual Spring Nature Festival sponsored by the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. Again, I'm Tom Romito and your host for this program. And I'm a board member of the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. And we are the fundraising arm of the refuge. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization established in 1997 to support Ohio's only national wildlife refuge complex with youth development, public use projects, and recently, most recently land acquisition and restoration. The refuge is located in the Western basin of Lake Erie, halfway between Port Clinton and Toledo, and some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you're interested in learning more about us and what we do, I'd like you to refer to the link that I'm gonna place in the chat box. And I'm gonna do that right now. Pausing. Okay. You should see three links. Please let me know in the chat box if you do not see them. The first link is our website, friendsofottawanwr.org. That link will point you in the right direction to become a member of the Friends of Ottawa, volunteer, make a tax deductible donation to support our work and to shop our online nature store. Right now our store is online. It's, it's a physical place at the visitor center, but it's closed right now. It has been for a year due to COVID. Now the second link is the Friends of Ottawa at Seek Refuge Days. That is the schedule for this virtual spring festival. And we're approximately on number six, I think, presentation and there's 25 altogether. So if you want to attend any presentation, you just need to register just like you did for this one. Uh, even if you don't register, you're still going, well, let me say that again. Uh, even if you don't attend, as long as you're registered, you'll get an email afterwards with a recording of the presentation on it, probably later in the day. And the third link is for a survey that we'd like you to take after the presentation to tell us how you think we did. And if you do that, you're going to get a, a benefit of a special coupon cord for the Rickery Nature Center Center the Rookery Nature Store online. Okay, today we're joined by Bernie Place of Wild Birds Unlimited in Toledo. Bernie has been a lifelong businessman, working in women's shoes for 14 years and Wild Birds Unlimited for the past 31 years. His interests include birds, boats, golf, and the weather. Let's listen as Bernie gives us tips for attracting orioles, hummingbirds, and other bring migrants to our habitat, our backyard habitats. So Bernie, you're on. Make sure that you start your video again. Okay. Hello, everybody. All right. So <clears throat> yeah, we're gonna talk about hummingbirds, orioles, uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, indigo bunnings, and how to attract all the different uh, variety of spring migrants to your yard. And uh, uh, first off, we'll uh, want us to share that one screen there of the uh, PowerPoint. Tom, would you like me to go ahead and start yes. that? Yes, please. Oh, okay, great. And there we go. Uh, here we go, share. There we are. And now we just want to um, get that from the beginning here. So full screen, Bernie. There we go. Good job. All right. So here we are. Um, picture on the Oriole. Sorry about that. It's a little blurry there. But uh, you get uh, the gist of the male Oriole. Beautiful bird. Uh, the more prominent Oriole that you'll see in the backyard. Uh, there's all, also the Bullocks Oriole. And of course, the male ruby-throated hummingbird that you see there too. And um, after a while, we'll get into some questions that you guys may have once we go through some of these slides and I have some other 
uh, ideas and uh, things that you can do to put out in your yard to attract a, a variety of birds. So here shows, uh, this is actually a Western um, shot of a black chin hummingbird and uh, the, uh, what could be, it looks like the ruby throat as well. Now, east of the Rockies, we have mainly just one species, the ruby throat hummingbird. And you have the male and the female. And on occasion in the fall, um, you can run across the Allens or uh, Rufus uh, hummingbird that can uh, migrate east uh, and uh, be out at kind of its uh, normal migration pattern. What they do is they sometimes uh, move more east instead of south, but they are western hummingbirds primarily. And so uh, what's interesting is hummingbirds only exist in the Americas, none in uh, southeast, uh, the southeast countries that you know of Vietnam or uh, Thailand or any of those areas, none in Africa, all only in the American continent. Uh, so east of the Rockies, we talked about that being the ruby-throated hummingbird. You can see there that the, the wings beat up to 200 times per second. Can you imagine that? And that their hearts beat up to 1,260 beats per minute. And you can see the other um, notations there. It's, it's uh, extremely interesting. What you, uh, what you see there is migrants that uh, uh, travel 2,000 miles down to Central and South America, depending on the species. Mainly our ruby-throated hummingbirds settle in Central America. And then when they start their migration back north, uh, often in February, they're starting to uh, uh, land in the uh, Gulf Coast region already. And then, of course, uh, they start their slow migration north over that period uh, from, uh, you know, obviously until they arrive here and then continue further north in some cases. So um, I'm not sure anybody have uh, any hummingbird sightings yet? Anybody want to chime in? Uh, we have not heard any of any hummingbird sightings in this area so far. I suspect, though, next week when we um, hit about 80, what, 80, low 80s, mid 80s, possibly Tuesday, Wednesday, that could be the very first push northward. We'll have southerly winds, and we'll be at that a time frame where the first arrivals can land in our area. Uh, so this being the, what, 24th today, um, I suspect at that time you'll start to see some of the hummingbirds arrive. And then Bernie, all throughout the month of May, too. Bernie, let me interject, please. Sure. Um, you asked a moment ago if anybody wanted to chime in. If anybody who wants to ask a question, please put it in the chat box. I will field it and, and, and uh, give it to Bernie as soon as possible so that we don't leave the slide of the topic that he's talking about. Okay, Bernie, proceed. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, and, and hummingbirds, it's really interesting how they can fly backwards, up, down, sideways. In their courtship uh, ritual, they will often do that to impress their mate. So it's, it's pretty cool. Now, with hummingbird feeders, uh, Often that the, what they do is they can actually perch. There's a kind of a misconception that they continue to fly uh, at all times, but they will land on perches of a hummingbird feeder. And uh, their beak goes to the opening of the hummingbird feeder, and then they have tongues that can extend like an inch and a half uh, that uh, drink the liquid, so which is pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, what's interesting to see at the bottom there is that the hummingbird egg 
is only the size of a pea or jelly bean. That's how small their eggs are. Um, here's a couple nice shots. Here's the male, the ruby throat, and the female. Now, uh, sometimes we get uh, some people who will see, depending on the hue of the sun, against uh, you know the the bird itself. Uh, the hue of the sun can make the female look more brownish instead of green. And you may not see the ruby throat at times with the male. So sometimes people will um, think that they're a different species when it depends. It's basically the ruby throat. But like I say, in the fall time, and uh, there can be wandering migrants from the west that come into our area, which is pretty cool. All right, so uh, what attracts a wide variety of birds, um, including hummingbirds? They need food, water, uh, shelter, uh, places to raise a family. You may recall the last couple years uh, in the springtime, especially the month of May, we've been having much colder than normal conditions, especially last year. And uh, we had a lot of the winds off the lake from the northeast. And what that did is that kept the Orioles and a lot of the spring migrants in our area where they decided to stay and nest. And that extended their season well into the summer, which was really fascinating. And we've been finding that out in recent years that uh, uh, with these conditions in May in particular, that uh, Orioles, instead, in continue, instead of continuing moving north, um, they settle in our area. This year is up in the air. It's hard to see what's going to happen. It's been very, uh, it's been variable as far as the weather's concerned. As we know, it's uh, last week we had that snow, and then uh, before during March and April, we had uh, much above normal temperatures. If we see that pattern come back in May where we have above normal temperatures, you can have a fly through uh, with a short stay of some of these species. Uh, but if, if the weather conditions are conducive for them to, uh, to not head north uh, as much, then we can retain more numbers of birds like the Orioles. Hummingbirds, regardless, will be around. Okay. Ernie, got a question. Yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Jake Worthington has asked, what type of hummingbird feeder is best to attract them? Uh, yes, in a little bit, uh, when we uh, go off the PowerPoint presentation, we're go I'm going to show you, I have some products here that I'm going to show on screen that will uh, be the best of the best type. The ones that I like are the ones that you, the one you see way in the, background there, um, the saucer type, but I'll show you uh, the mechanics of it uh, once we get to that point for sure. Okay, okay. Oh, here's kind of going back to that. Isn't that a great habitat right there? Um, you don't have to have all grass uh, in your habitat. Uh, you know, you can do native wildflowers. You can have uh, water in your yard. You can, you can imagine here these type of florals that will attract butterflies and hummingbirds uh, like crazy. Um, and so that's the kind of thing you can do to uh, attract really all varieties of birds in a great habitat like that. Now, if you want bluebirds, of course, you wouldn't want that type of habitat so much. You want open area, open grassy area. Uh, rural settings are a great example of that. Uh, here we go with uh, uh, what I found in our yard is a cardinal climber does a fantastic job in uh, drawing the hummingbirds. Cardinal climbers. And so there are tons of different types of flowers like fuchsia, impatience, and um, 
foxglove, et cetera, that can draw hummingbirds as well. But did you know that hummingbirds also like mosquitoes and gnats, uh, spiders? So uh, they do uh, consume quite a few of the insects um, that they prefer out in the you know, out in the wild, and of course, uh, sugar water, anything with uh, nectar from plants, etc. One part sugar, four parts water is what's recommended. No red dye, because they can they have found that that can be harmful um, to the hummingbird. And there are mixes out there with the red dye in it. We do not recommend it. Isn't that cool? Now that hummingbird's nest um, is camouflaged. Well, I should, let's go back here because what I like to uh, ask the audience, although I'm not sure we're in a, in a position to ask uh, or with a follow-up uh, answer, but hummingbird's nests are made out of what primarily? Spider webs and lica, lichen. Um, and then they camouflage the nest uh, with leaf or little pieces of bark that blend into the natural surrounding, which is really cool. Now that hummingbird's nest, the opening is only the size of a quarter. Isn't that amazing? Only the size of a quarter. But you can imagine within that size, the uh, jelly bean or pea-sized pea egg can easily fit in to that nest. When they hatch, and then you have, see there, the babies in there, once they hatch and start to grow, the nest can expand a little. So that's pretty cool. Here are some of the uh, popular nectar plants. And there's the cardinal flower, but it's not the same as the cardinal climber, but these are all really good ones. Um, where we find the cardinal climber every year to put in our yard is out there on Route 2. I uh, believe it's called Benches. And uh, I'd call in advance because last year they had a problem getting them, but we still uh, called and found out that they did sock it and uh, were able to plant it. Um, so I think we, we did that by seed, if I remember right. So um, Cardinal Climber. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, we do have basically some uh, powdered um, hummingbird and oriole nectar. We stock at the store and, and also I will show you some liquid concentrate that has something called Nectar Defender in it that makes the nectar last three times longer. Uh, but we'll get to that in a, in a bit here. Things that you can do also with water are sprays. And uh, wow, look at that, an evening grow speak. <laughs> in that far left upper uh, picture. That's more of a fall migrant in our area, which this year, this past year, was once in a 20-year um, migration pattern that we saw those guys. The last time was 20 years ago where people sighted them in the area. But it's a northern grosbeak. Anyway, uh, misters are a great way to attract hummingbirds. And you can see this uh, um, stand here with the two hanging planters and you got the hummingbird feeder and you got that mist. They like to fly, fly through those. Up here is what's called the leaf mister. And that throws a mist against leaves, which then the birds will leaf bathe against those leaves and so that's cool and of course uh the bird bath there you see there the mist or drip 
on uh, that spout over the bird bath where those gross beaks are. Ernie, excuse me. Sure. We have a question that's pertinent here. All right. Is there a better location for your feeder uh, under a soffit or out in the open off a hook or a tree? Uh, shade is recommended uh, for a hummingbird feeder. There are lids if you prefer to have it out in the open um, that can go over a, a hummingbird feeder. And then these saucer type feeders, uh, you may consider that uh, they are used for shade and uh, as a rain guard. So that's a possibility. Uh, shade is best uh, over flower garden area. You can suspend them right outside your window. Our ruby-throated hummingbirds are not shy, so that you can even hang them uh, within a bird feeding station, uh, whether you have two or three other feeders in the mix. Uh, the best spot, I would say, would be over your flower garden area where you still have the sight of being able to see them in a shady spot. Uh, decorative hummingbird feeders, uh, they're available. Uh, ones we carry in the good old USA. And uh, at any rate, that uh, what we recommend for these guys is to fill them to the top any of the hummingbird feeders and, and where the um, you have the gravity type uh, feeder like this, fill them to the top to create a vacuum. Uh, so then you don't have the dripping issue. And here's some other types, very pretty. Hummingbird feeders. Well, now here's Western hummingbirds that are very social. You won't see that with our ruby-throated hummingbird because they're territorial when they feed. So generally you'll see one at a time visit the feeder uh, as far as our ruby throats are concerned. This happens to be a shot from out west. But nevertheless, a window hummingbird feeder will attract hummingbirds too. And uh, this way you get that bird's eye view no pun intended. All right. Oh boy, isn't that beautiful? The male uh, Oriole. And uh, now I don't know if anybody in our group has seen any, but we were getting a few calls and even a couple Facebook um, mentions that uh, people had seen Orioles uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so far since, uh, well, probably in the last 10 days, we've not had any reports, but I also suspect that next week will be our first arrivals with that southerly wind flow. And wow, 24 species of Orioles all live in North and South America. What we primarily see is the Baltimore Oriole, and there can be also the Orchard Oriole. All right, and then some of the other Orioles are Western variety. There's the female, how about that? Doesn't that look uh, quite a bit different than the male? But you'll see them visit too at the feeders. They have a sack-like nest, as you can see here, and uh, that can hang from any of the limbs and from the trees, et cetera. They, they are main, mainly, they forage along the treetop zones once they get established in our area and after they raise their young. They forage on insects and caterpillars and off leaves in the treetop zone areas, but you can still hear them with their distinctive sound, their call that they have. Okay, um, what a beautiful shot that is, eh? With the uh, great jelly and oranges. Now, um, a lot of you may already know from experience uh, over the years of feeding the Orioles that grape jelly is their number one 
uh, food source that they like well, as far as what we put out for them. Uh, great jelly. Now, don't seek anything with artificial flavoring. They don't care and they will notice the difference. Uh, no sh uh, sugar substitutes either in the grape jelly. Get the, just a regular old grape jelly, um, whether it be Smucker's or Welch's, uh, but check out those ingredients. We have something here called birdberry jelly that has blackberry and grape um, that uh, we sell here at the store. Okay, another feeder type. I'm going after the oranges. And I, I know outside the nature centers, whether, uh, you know, at uh, Ottawa or at, at McGee Marsh, they often will put oranges out for them and spear them on limbs of trees in the Orioles can be coaxed where people can see them better. Um, here's another. Now, so, what's interesting is you'll find sometimes the Orioles will visit hummingbird feeders and they've been, uh, they even pluck out those yellow flowers you see in this particular shot. They'll pluck those yellow flowers out of the feeder and uh, they will uh, consume the sugar water. Excuse me, Bernie? Yes. Another great pertinent question. Okay. Does jelly need to be refrigerated because the, the, the attendee doesn't see anything on her container? I know. I, we, the ones that we have here, but then again, they're sealed. I can check well, this bottle here just out of example. I uh, don't see anything that this needs to be refrigerated. Uh, so I would say, I would say no, if, you know, um, just keep it sealed with the, you know, obviously don't leave the lid off or anything like that where the air can get to it. But I'm, I'd say you're fine there. Just uh, not having to refrigerate it. Thanks, Bernie. You're welcome. Oh, there's the, now this happens to be, I believe, a, a immature male. Because we, we saw there earlier, let's go back up. Um, the female, see, see the female there? And you'll notice in this, uh, that one slide coming up, that that appears to be the immature male. Oriole. So, because they sport that orange as opposed to the olive, yellow olive color. And uh, here's a different type of feeder that uh, has a three in one way of feeding orange, nectar, and grape jelly. Okay, well, that's, that's an oldie. And don't. By the way, if you see this out there, I don't recommend it. Um, this was an old slide, but I do not recommend that feeder because they reach in there for jelly and they can get their feathers all sticky. So even though that was new at the time, not recommended. Okay, so then I'm going to stop the share on this, right? And... Are we back? Okay. So um, from there, I can show you, um, let's see, how do we want to do this, Tom? Do, can people see this okay? That's the kind of hummingbird feeder you want, okay? Do I need to expand the screen? Can't seem to hear you, Tom. Um, there we go. Participants, you should all go full screen. There's a oh. toggle at the top of, the, of your screen that, that allows you to, to, to change the view. Okay. So, Bernie, uh, let, let, please tell me, gang, if uh, you're unable to get um, 
burning full burning on their full screen. So until we know, Bernie, why don't you proceed with your discussion? Okay. So this shows the uh, the type of feeder we recommend because for several reasons, um, it's easier for the birds to be able to feed with what's, what's called this high perch uh, um, feeder. Um, and what they do is they'll perch and then feed at a very uh, easy uh, way for them to feed. It just makes it easier for them to rest and perch. And then uh, the lid just simply pops off like that. And you have open access for wiping out the feeder and cleaning it. Mm. Um, the bottle type, the other types can be quite difficult um, in comparison. I'll show you. Excuse me, Bernie, they, some of the um, participants are saying you might wanna be in speaker view, click view speaker. Um, on your view options. Okay, let's see where. Should be at the top of the screen. Okay. Nope, I just, okay, wait a minute here. Ask to unmute. Uh, no, no. no at the oh, here we go. All right, wrong one. Uh, it says um, spotlight video. Is that any of those? No. Nope. Uh, how about I'm Julia? Can you lend uh, some help here? Um, I believe if the participants click speaker view, they'll be able to see Bernie. So if anybody wants to do that, they can just go up to the top of their screen and click speaker view. There you and go. It will make Bernie large when he's talking, so you should be all set. Can you see me now? <laughs> yes. All right, perfect. So this particular uh, feeder that uh, has been a traditional for a long time, and people swear by this feeder, so we continue to stock it. And, uh, but, even though they have made it a little easier over the years to clean it, you still got all those little bee guard parts, et cetera. And then these things get pulled off for cleaning the spout. Um, and that's the flower you pull off in the bee guard, but all in all much tougher to clean where we find that these uh, saucer type are the way to go. And they also have the built-in ant trap in the middle and by what I mean by the ant trap is you fill the middle right here with water okay and it's got an even overflow so it can't overflow uh, uh, over the top of the feeder and uh, make the um, the uh, nectar itself weaker so it does have an inside overflow and what that does that moat acts as a trap to keep the ants from getting over to the feeding ports. Um, also at the bottom of the lid on these is uh, we have these tabs right there that you can feed uh, or you can fit a bee guard over. Um, they're little uh, plastic uh, um, pieces that fit over it that are slitted that the tongue can still easily go through and drink the liquid but keeps the bees from getting inside the reservoir of the feeder. And uh, once again one part sugar four parts water and uh, very easy to clean. Uh, being in the reservoir the uh, food is below the feeding port you're not going to have the dripping issues that you can with an upright. So, okay. Bernie, um, we, have a, we have another great question. It's more great. of a com comment. Sharon says, it would be great if Wild Birds Unlimited would recommend and sell Doug Ptolemy's books, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope about creating native habitats in our yards to stop the extinction of our local birds. 
Yeah, let's. <clears throat> I had Nature's Best Hope for a while there. Um, need to order that back in if that's the one. But let me uh, you know, let no, me pick that author's name. I actually just got the uh, Nature's Best Hope into the Rookery Nature Store as well. It just came in on Wednesday night, so okay. Feel free to check out. <clears throat> store as well for that book great great um what's the author's name again doug tallamy t-a-l-l-a-m-y very good i'll check that out all right better write it down so i don't forget <laughs> um okay so uh, other possibilities, uh, these are beautiful feeders made in the USA. Um, now these uh, have a very high U-shaped uh, feeding port, which really does help keep that from any drippage. But just to let you know that there are pretty hummingbird feeders that are functional and then uh, brushes and mops. Um, highly recommended to keep your feeders clean. And these are little port brushes that are available to get into those feeding ports that you see right there, okay? Um, <clears throat> also good for those, uh, some of those tubes like this for cleaning. Uh, this just simply, pops open like that and then you can reach a, the uh, brush inside. Um, mops, mop, you wet the mop first and those mops go inside the bottles and you can clean them accordingly, okay? Um, now this is really nice. This is very convenient. <clears throat> called Nectar Defender. It's all natural. Uh, it's got a mineral micronutrient in that's completely safe for the hummingbirds. Um, and what that does is keep the nectar uh, fresh three times longer than uh, normally it would. So <clears throat> um, let's say, in this kind of weather we have today, it's in the mid 50s, you may have mid 60s, you can go a full week without having to change the nectar in the feeders, okay? Uh, that's basically a five to seven day window. As you get warmer, get in the 70s and 80s, low 80s, then you wanna reduce the time to three to five days for changing the nectar when it's hot in the 90s, every other day, change the nectar. But now with this, you can, you can wait almost a week in those 90 degree days without changing the nectar because of this. So uh, a week, a week's time where you have this in this kind of weather before you change it, this will make it last three times longer three weeks. How about that? So that's a great um, little uh, way to feed. Now this this bottle here is a concentrate. It's, uh, you make a one to three ratio with that. It's got the Nectar Defender already in it. So just showing you because uh, there are new products out there to make it easier and uh, you don't have to um, maintenance it as, as much as you did in the past, okay? Uh, let's see here, a few other things I wanted to show. Oh yes, let's show that three-in-one hummingbird or uh, Oriole feeder, okay? Uh, the handle is actually got a spear at the end to be able to skewer the orange half onto the feeder. Now there's, there's something I wanted to mention. <clears throat> I'm sure there's a lot of people who recycle their milk jugs, right? They throw them in the, in the bin, okay? At the uh, stores, whatever. 
don't think much uh, of it after that. Uh, what happens, they take those melt jugs and they melt them down and they make plastic lumber and they inject a dye which can color the uh, lumber. Uh, well, actually before it's, it's solid and becomes lumber. Well, that's where these feeders can come in handy is uh, these feeders are made out of recycled milk jugs. And this one was, uh, this one here is made out of eight recycled milk jugs. The majority of our feeders, whether it's uh, a style like that or our hopper feeders are made out of recycled milk jugs. They don't rot, split, fade, or crack. Um, easy to wash. You're not cutting down trees to make the feeders. And so the longevity and the easy way to clean them is made that category very popular. Um, long lasting, uh, easy button, so to speak. Here's something else. I don't know if people have our pull system or not, but um, this can be adapted onto our pull system. It's an easy attach and it's got cups for jelly and it's got the uh, place to hold oranges for Orioles. I wanted to show some uh, pictures, additional pictures. Um, of our Orioles. Oh, here's the Orchard Oriole. See there? And it looks to be the female. See, now what they have here is an orange half that has the grape jelly inside. So they've maybe eaten part of that orange and put some jelly in it. Is that cool? Bernie, I've got a question for you. Yep. This is so cool. I think everybody on the call is having a great time. Teresa says, for Oriole feeders, can you use clementines instead of oranges? Yeah, I don't see why not. It's part of a, a fruit um, that uh, can be offered. Um, they are fruit eating birds in South America as well in, as insect eating. So <clears throat> I don't see any problem with that. Great, Bernie. And also, how often should you change your grape jelly? I would uh, put out, you know, the warmer the weather, uh, the more often you should change it. So where you can get away with three to four days, um, check it and make sure it's not infested with any insects. Um, again, with oreo feeders, you can use uh, the moats, um, independent ant moats over the over the feeder that you fill with water to control the ants. But insects in general can make a mess with the grape jelly. So I would monitor that. Um, and again, the warmer the weather, the more you need to change it. So if you get in the 80s and 90s, then every day put fresh, clean out the jar, et cetera. Okay, hey, Bernie. And, yeah. and one more question for right now. I may yeah. have missed this somewhere, but for the Orioles, does it matter where you place your feeder in the open or close to a porch? It can, they, they're a tree uh, foraging bird. So from trees is best. Um, you can hang them from a porch. Uh, if you have some trees close by that can aid and bringing them and coaxing them to those areas. Uh, but tree limbs are very popular for Oriole feeders. You can suspend them on hooks, shepherd hooks uh, as well, but uh, that's their normal foraging areas in within the tree itself. And Bernie, what height for the Oriole feeders and hummingbirds feeders? Uh, hummingbird feeders can be variable. Uh, they can be in an upstairs balcony, uh, in an apartment complex, uh, two or three stories high. Uh, they can be ground level, um, you know, a couple, two, three feet off the ground. 
suspended over flowers is great. We have special design hummingbird poles that are meant to suspend feeders over those uh, flowered areas. <clears throat> um, with Orioles, I recommend uh, basically eye level is good. Again, uh, that can vary, but not any less than five, six feet off the ground for Orioles. Bernie, I'm going to keep going with the questions for right Excuse now. I have a fruit feeder, Sharon says. What other fruit might attract other birds? Uh, oh, gosh, you can attract um, with apples, <clears throat> house finches, red belly woodpeckers, uh, cat birds, robins, bluebirds, um, the you know thrush family of birds, which include uh, the um, the robins and bluebirds and catbirds, uh, mockingbirds, the ones that maybe you might spot from time to time and go after fruit. So yeah, you may see uh, uh, the uh, catbird uh, that can visit uh, a grape jelly feeder as well, or or even the orange. They're an interesting, neat bird to see. <clears throat> Great, Bernie. We're out of questions for the moment, so you can continue with whatever you've got. All righty. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yes. There's that immature oriole. Now, that other species, I'm not sure what that one is, but it's not conducive to our area, but that's an immature oriole on the on the right of the screen there. Oh yes, we've got to talk about these guys. And <clears throat> part of the spring migrants, besides orioles and hummingbirds, you'll be seeing those in a couple of weeks, about two to three weeks. Generally, right around the biggest week of American birding time, people see these rose-breasted grosbeaks. Okay, and they like sunflower seeds. So that's a good one. Let me find another uh, photo here. Oh, now this happens to be the female rose-breasted grosbeak. Altogether different, isn't it? And you can see that beak being uh, what they call the gross beak very thick and easy uh, to be able to crack open seeds. Oil sunflower, striped sunflower, safflower, all good seeds for them to eat. Oh, how about this one <clears throat> coming up soon? Uh, about the same time that the rose-breasted grosbeaks show up is the indigo bunny. There's the male and beautiful bird. They will stop at the uh, stop by at the finch feeders and they like white millet. Okay. May is the month of May, the end of April and the month of May is the um, the Mecca time for seeing the spring migrants uh, coming through the yards, of course the warblers from South America, South and Central America. How about this one? Scarlet tanager. Okay. That one is farther and fewer between at the feeders or whether they show up in your yard, but they do uh, at times. And that's something uh, that you would definitely see out there at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge and that whole area, whether it being there or McGee Marsh. So I've seen this one pretty steadily at the Indigo Bunny at Maumee Bay State Park. But again, Ottawa is a place to go and McGee. So A beautiful shot of that ruby throated hummingbird again. <laughs> All right, so 
Uh, do I got anything else here? Oh, um, there's that birdberry jelly. Yeah, you can pick up here. We sell tons of that coming up soon. And then this, uh, another way of feeding um, that's less mess is the cylinder feeders that are compacted with uh, premium food. That's a great draw for the uh, rose-breasted gross beaks as well. Another thing. Hanging trays for gross beaks. Uh, that's another easy way to be able to view all birds that visit at the feeder. So that's, uh, I'd like to open it up for other questions if, if we can. That's pretty much what I got to show. And Great, um, Bernie. You, you are the retailer par excellence. I, <clears throat> I and I'm sure everybody else really appreciates your show and tell. So I'll tell you what, listening audience, <clears throat> this, is, this is your time. If you want to ask Bernie a question, let's just do it out loud. All you got to do is unmute yourself or press the space bar. And, and speak, ask Bernie your question. Go right ahead. Bernie, what would you put on that platform feeder for the gross beaks? Yeah, I would recommend uh, a mix of oil sunflower, striped sunflower, safflower is good. Um, you can go straight oil sunflower. That would probably be their favorite. How how high do those platform feeders would you normally put that? Five to six feet off the ground. <laughs> that's one thing uh, that's interesting that you ask that. And that's a good question because there are definitely different varieties of species that feed off the ground, five to six feet off the ground, as opposed to birds that feed on the ground. And then there's species that also feed on the ground and at the feeder too, like cardinals. Um, so, but you'd never really see a chickadee or a nuthatch that much feed off the ground. So um, yeah, it's, an, it's a good question. I have a question. How do you keep the blackbirds? They have just been eating. I've been filling my feeders twice a day. It's crazy. I would, uh, start mixing with safflower seed and okay. uh, that uh, basically over a 10 to two week period using uh, half safflower, half like the food you've been using. And then in two weeks, make it straight safflower seed. And that's the time then you'll get rid of the, uh, the starlings, the grackles, the brown headed cowbirds, um, Blue jays are not fond of it. They'll eat it, but um, it's also keeps the squirrels out of the feeders using safflower. And this time of year, um, well, even going back is, is uh, going back to February, we had that uh, cold and snow spell that uh, we were getting a lot of calls with that issue. Starling moved in and flocked in at the feeders. And uh, so it's been an issue now with grackles and it usually is every spring. So safflower is the way to go. Um, and introducing it slowly is, is getting, you don't, you're not gonna lose the birds for a while, so to speak, because any kind of men, menu change of food can spoof away the birds for a while. So yeah, that's a good way to do it. Thank you, great. Are there any other questions from the floor, so to speak? Uh, Bernie, is there any uh, bird feeder cameras that you recommend? I'm using a blink right now and I'm not getting real good pictures. Um, you, there's, I have to, like, uh, put it right there. <laughs> yeah, there's one called Bird's Eye, um, the Bird's Eye Cam, I believe. Oh, there's, um, trying to think of the other ones. Uh, you know, there's some good ones online that you would probably see a uh, review on um, that range uh, probably around $150 to $200. The good ones. 
Uh, but I think it was a bird's eye cam or hawk eye cam or something. There may be a couple of them like that that uh, you might be, be able to investigate. Those high tech, higher tech items are generally online. Pricing is pretty good. All right, Bernie and ladies and gentlemen, we're nearly at the top of the hour and I'm going to make some closing remarks before we let you all go. Please remember I put the three links in the chat room and the first one is our website for the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. If you wanna know anything about the refuge and the friends group, that's where to go. Uh, the second one is the Seek Refuge Day schedule. So get on there and register for any other programs that you want to. And the third one is for a, uh, a survey you can take to kind of rate us on our skill on this presentation. If you do, you'll get a special coupon code for the Rookery Nature Store online. And you're also gonna get the recording by virtue of having registered for this program.